of you all and in different aspects and in different ways. And it's great to see you here today on Zoom as well as Facebook. And we're very excited about this first opportunity to see how technology can work for us in different ways. The historical so staff, um, historical society staff has been home working and working hard um, like a lot of us since the middle of March. And one of the things we've been exploring are all kinds of technology platforms and seeing how we might be able to complement what we typically do with um, new opportunities. And so this is, this is our first effort at that. We hope you enjoy it. Um, one of the things we've always prided ourselves on is getting people out into the region. And sometimes that's a big production with transportation and fees and um, all kinds of things. But with this technology, we can now kind of go on the road and have virtual visits um, remotely um, and enjoy it. And so we hope though that everyone will get out when they have the opportunity and when they deem that it's best um, to actually visit the sites that we that we take you to on these virtual visits. So we will be starting here in just a moment with Ranger Rex Road, with Ranger Justin Rex Road at the Telco Blockhouse. But I also wanna mention that we already have another virtual visit scheduled for next week with the birthplace of country music up the road in Bristol. It'll be at the same time, one o'clock next Thursday. Um, and the other great thing about that is you have the email address. So if you're interested and want to attend, then just use the same eths at easttnhistory.org website and we can get you signed up for that and get you the same sort of login information for the Zoom program next week. So again, welcome. I know we have a few folks that have just joined and entered um, into our program. So we welcome you whether you're on Facebook Live or you're with us through Zoom. Um, as I said, we have another program scheduled for next week, but we're excited for this week's program. And I'm Lisa Oakley, I'm Curator of Education at the Historical Society, and we're happy to be visiting with you virtually today. Stephanie Henry um, and Justin Rex Road will be having questions and answer at the end of the program today. And if you see on your toolbar, there is a chat function. And so during the program at any time, you are welcome to type in a question and we will be getting those together and sharing those with Justin at the end of the program so that we can get your questions answered. So if there's anything like that that you wanna share or communicate, if something, if the sound, you know, is, we can't do anything about the wind, we're outside right now, we're all virtually outside, so that has some effect on the sound, but please know that you can communicate with us through chat, especially for your questions and answer. Um, so, we have everyone muted um, right now. It does not matter if you wanna leave your video on, you're welcome to, or you can stop your video. Either way, you still will have access and enjoy the program with Justin. And, um, but we will be keeping everyone muted and then we will handle the question and answer with um, participants at the end. As I said, Stephanie will be gathering that information from Facebook as well as from the chat box on Zoom to make sure that questions get answered. Again, welcome. Um, we're very glad that you're here. The Historical Society has been excited to find ways that we can continue to serve um, and share this wonderful East Tennessee history and a great way to share the regional historical societies, historical organizations, sites, museums from around the region. And we're getting ready to turn it over to Ranger Rex Road. But just to remind those of y'all that have just joined, we will be doing this again next week. Same day, same time, only we'll be going to the other end of East Tennessee, to the birthplace of country music in Bristol. So I think that's enough from me. Um, again, welcome. We've been excited to do this with you all, and we look forward to, to the program that Ranger Rex Road has for us. Justin Rex Road um, is an interpretive ranger and ranger um, with the Fort Loudon State Parks. Um, or State Park along with his specialty now is with Telco Blockhouse and he's ready I think to share with us the story from the Telco Blockhouse. So welcome Justin and thank you. Thank you Miss Lisa. I, uh, I appreciate that great intro and, uh, and y'all do a wonderful job up there at the East Tennessee Historical Society. So again I want to welcome you to the Telco Blockhouse. Uh, we are a 
a, a satellite of Fort Loudon State Historic Park under the Tennessee State Park System. Uh, this is a site that sometimes gets overlooked by the, by the shadow of Fort Loudon. Uh, Fort Loudon is dealing with the French and Indian War or Seven Years War if you are from Europe. And, uh, and so it is about 30 to 40 years before the period we're talking about now. So this period here, we're gonna be looking at the United States Army and we're gonna be looking at the relationship with the US Army and the Cherokee in a uh, fledging and uh, growing state that is Tennessee. Uh, so I'm gonna take you back in time before Tennessee was a state and, uh, and talk to you a little bit about this fortification and others in the local area, even tying in Knoxville to you. And then we'll go out throughout the Tennessee's uh, what comes statehood and then a little bit past it as well. So again, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, so to get started with you all, I know I, my uniform looks a little funny. Uh, if you haven't uh, been used to historical programs or uh, used to the, the dressing of the times. Uh, but what I am wearing today is what the U.S. soldiers would have been wearing uh, at the time statehood. Uh, so I am a soldier in the third sub-legion, uh, which is under General Mad Anthony Wayne uh, of Revolutionary War fame. And uh, he has been called out of uh, retirement uh, to assist the United States and assist uh, President Washington uh, in quelling the, the Native Americans in the Ohio Territory, and then also uh, wrangling up these white militiamen that are running rampant through Tennessee and murdering uh, peaceful Cherokee. So that's kind of our goal here. Now to back up a little bit more though, at the end of the, of the American Revolution, United States Army, the United States government was just a baby. They didn't know which way direction it was going to go. And so he got a lot of new territory from Britain uh, all the way to the Mississippi River. But who was there uh, in that land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River? The Native Americans. Well, the Native Americans weren't invited to the Treaty of Paris. They weren't invited to the end of the American Revolution. So they are still at war with whoever is trying to take over their land, and now it is the United States of America. So fast forward up to about 1790, we have some terrible, terrible defeats of you know, U.S. Army, uh, uh, of huge U.S. armies that go out and try to quell these Native Americans and bring them under control. And Little Turtle and Blue Jacket are two of the most famous ones from the, the Maumee Territory up near around Toledo. Uh, and the Great Lakes region there in Ohio. And they have put a stop to any U.S. troop movements in the area. And they have, in a way, massacred every army that has tried to come at them. They are a, a, a terrifying force. So uh, what President Washington, you know, being a, uh, a still new to all this, and still new to uh, this, this undeveloped country, He's at, a, he's at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. You know, we don't have enough money to pay for an army. We don't want a standing army. What do we do? So he calls his dear friend, uh, Anthony Wayne, out of retirement. And he calls upon his other dear friend, Henry Knox, which all Knoxville people should know who Henry Knox is, uh, they, uh, uh, to help him and to, to bring peace to the frontier and to try to bring peace to these Native Americans. So in 1794, Anthony Wayne leads his men, the, the uh, U.S. Army Legion, out of Legionville, which is near uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania today, leads them from there, and he goes out in search of Little Turtle and Blue Jacket. The Little Turtle and Blue Jacket are very confident in their actions at this point in time, so they expect the U.S. Army to do the exact same thing they've done over and over again and walk right into a trap. So this time, Anthony Wayne made sure their supply lines were strong, and, and made sure that even if they were going to come under attack, they would win the day. And he does so at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in August of 1794. Uh, but they make a terrible, terrible discovery at that battle. They realize that there are British troops assisting these Native Americans and have even built a fort amongst United States territory land. So what does that mean? What does that mean for, for the Treaty of Paris? Did they break the Treaty of Paris? Absolutely. Uh, so what does that mean? Are they still out there? Are they still meaning to take over the United States? Also, we have an issue with Spain. Spain is still at the cusp of the United States in Florida and out in Texas and Louisiana area. So they're still eyeballing this, this, this baby of a nation and seeing what they can take from them. 
So Anthony Wayne had to train his men well and train them fast uh, to be able to fight amongst the frontier and to be able to defend this nation. Thus leading us to 1794 after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, we have uh, the Southwest uh, uh, Regional Governor is then uh, William Blunt. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of William Blunt. Uh, he would later become our, one of our first senators of Tennessee and uh, has a big to do with building a Knoxville. Uh, he is asked by a Cherokee chief called Hanging Mall to come down and try to bring peace to this area. Hanging Mall is so tired of fighting and his Cherokee people are so tired of, of having to deal with these white men moving into the area and breaking these treaties that they ask for assistance from the federal government instead of the local militias. So in route uh, to meet with Hanging Mall, William Blunt's party falls under attack by uh, white men dressed as Native Americans. Later on, one of John Sevier's lieutenants is actually tried for this, this action against William Blunt and against Hanging Mall. So you know, we'll talk a little more about John Sevier in a little bit. But anyways, going back to that, uh, Hanging Mall and William Blunt both survived the attack. They both survived the, the, um, the issue that happens. William Blunt soon realizes that he has lost control of the frontier. He has lost control of the militia. He, is not, he, does, not have, he does not have it all together. So he then asks Anthony Wayne, asks George Washington, asks Henry Knox, I need help. I need help with troops. So the third sub-legion after the Battle of Fallen Timbers is sent down to Knoxville to fortify Knoxville. They are sent down to, to build this site that we're going to look at today, which is called the Temple Blockout. And then this, and we're also going to look at Fort Southwest Point, which uh, John Sevier did actually build, but the U.S. Army did commandeer from him. And so we're going to learn about these sites here today and their significance for Tennessee's history. So where we're standing at right now is actually amongst the ruins of the blockhouse. And where I'm physically standing at is actually the old rope bed that led up to what would later be called Maryville and what would later be, and then of course Knoxville. So the old Niles Ferry Road, uh, that, which is, you can still drive today, this is actually part of the original part of the old Niles Ferry Road. It went all the way up to Knoxville, came all the way down to right here to these gate, and then ended at a ferry right over here next to the water. So the U.S. Army, was ordered to build a ferry here. So that way Cherokees that were still living on this side of the river uh, could get over to that side and vice versa. Now, once this site was built, Hanging Mall signed another treaty with uh, the United States of America, the first treaty of the, tel of the Teleco. And it gave, it made sure that air, all the land south of the Little Tennessee River would remain Cherokee. Everything on the north side here up uh, to about uh, Lenore City and then uh, over to um, uh, Six Mile, Tennessee and on up would be actually United States property at this point. It also meant that all these other treaties were null and void. So all these little treaties that John Sevier and, and, uh, and William Blunt had signed beforehand, they were all null and void because they were not signed by the United States government. The United States government decided that this was a foreign um, issue. So that way the federal government needs to step in. Clears mud? I thought so. So over here, across the river, there would have been a number of Cherokee towns dotting up along the river here. And right now we're actually looking over towards old Fort Loudon. Uh, in old Fort Loudon, there actually was uh, some Cherokee houses built there and the town of Tuskegee sat right outside of it. So this site was really close to the town of Tuskegee. Now, with the building of this ferry, though, George Washington himself said he did not want any of the natives, any natives that was, that was peaceful with the United States to be charged for using that ferry. So they could use it as much as they want to. Any whites, though, that came into the area, they had to pay. And they also had to meet with the officer in charge here at the blockhouse to gain a permit to be able to go into Cherokee territory. So it's a big change on Native American policy up to this point. Beforehand, it's just take or kill. Now it's starting to become regulate and make sure we have paperwork involved. Okay, so let's take a walk. So 
right now we're standing at the front gates. This is the main gate to the Teleco blockhouse. And this first section we're gonna look explore first is the first phase of the blockhouse. It was built in 1794. And then eventually it would actually progress all the way up. They would actually build other sections here of the blockhouse. So, but this first part here is, is just a military installation. It was not, uh, at, their initial thought here was that they were just going to bring peace to the area, form checkpoints, make this a militarized zone. Uh, eventually, and George Washington was already thinking about this, he wanted to make this a, a, uh, a trading post and what they would call a factory at that point in time, which we'll talk about here in just a few minutes. But as we're walking through here, and again, for those of you at home, this stonework here is the original stonework from the, the Teleco blockhouse. Uh, all the T-Deck and all the state of Tennessee has only done is to stabilize this area. So this is the original stonework here. And this is what makes the site so unique. You know, at Fort Loudon, unfortunately, uh, it was all buried by the TVA and they had to rebuild it. This one here, we actually still have it preserved in a way. So, but if we're looking right here, this building we're standing next to was one of the first buildings built. This was uh, the Commandant's quarters. Uh, so, Lieutenant Henry Sparks was the first commander here at the Telco Blockhouse. This would have been his office and it would have been a two story building. Now, the next building that was built was this one right here. And this is actually the first barracks that uh, was built here on the first phase. We also would have had a tower here in this corner. And we would have had a well built as well, which is still actually a well. You can actually look down into it. It still has water in it. So yeah, let's, let's take a look. And as you can see behind me here, we actually have started to rebuild the fortification here. We do actually have hopes of rebuilding sections of this, of this fort. Uh, so this actually was the site of the first tower here. It would have been another two-story building. And then the posts you see around here, I get this question quite a bit. The posts you see around here, that's where the Palisade walls would have sat at. Uh, so, so in a way, this blockhouse, did it have the elements of a blockhouse to it? Absolutely. But it honestly looked more like a fort than a blockhouse, just because of all the palisade walls involved in here and how tall they were. But with the well here, we can still actually look down and we can still see water down into this well here. So that's why we have to have graded, but nobody falls down into there. Those small children fall down in there. So as we walk back out here, one of the other unique things about this site was the other building adjacent from the Commandant's quarters was actually a jail. Now, why would they build a jail here at this fort? Well, their intention initially was to make sure that the white settlers were not breaking the first Treaty of Teleco. So they were actually making, uh, I don't want to say raids, but they were actually going out into Cherokee land and actually removing white squatters that had broken that treaty. And they first would give them a warning, tell them to leave, but if they did not leave, that's where they would be put at. They'd be put in jail for that. So you can imagine this U.S. Army coming down and kind of throwing its weight around. You can imagine with some of these uh, white, uh, white settlers that are in the, air, the area, you can imagine how they felt about that. You know, for years they had been suffering at the hands of the natives and for years they had been killed and their family, their, their Nepal, Mal Mal's, you know, they're all getting killed off by the natives. So they want retribution. So U.S. Army coming in saying, you can't do that no more. You know, it kind of rubs, uh, rubs in the wrong way. So this is a, a unique situation here. So. so as we're walking still, now I'm going to fast forward a little bit more to 1796. And 1796, if you are a good Tennessean, you would know that year by heart. Because that is the year that this actually becomes a state. So uh, when the blockhouse, uh, during the state celebration, there was actually a, a big festival uh, held here uh, that involved the, the natives and involved the soldiers here in celebration of it becoming a state. And also, William Blunt and other political leaders saw this as a good thing. 
because now we can actually, you know, have a state militia again, have a state representatives, and not have to play that whole game of are we, you know, territory of North Carolina, are we the state of Franklin, or who are we? So we are now Tennesseans. So one of the things that George Washington wanted built uh, during that time of uh, 1796, he wanted for the factory to be built here. Now, when I say factory, we're not talking about uh, building steel and building things. We're actually talking about trade. So he wanted trade to come in for the Cherokee to help them. And I, I hate to use this analogy, but I think it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, but uh, some of our reenactors kind of called this the Cherokee Co-op in a way. So this is a place where they can go and get their farming equipment, can go and get their, their seeds, come get their tools, things like that. So this building here is actually the site of the factory. So with that said, there was actually two more positions added, political positions added for this, this fort. So we have a factor and we have a, uh, uh, an Indian agent, as they were called at the time. So the factor was a man that uh, would be regulating the trade coming in and out of the, of the fortification here. And George Washington himself wanted to see this. He wanted to see that this trade was actually done at price. He did not want to, to make a profit off of any of these trade goods. This was a way to prepare relationship the United States Army the United States of America had with the Cherokee people. So this is the side of the factory. They also had an Indian agent. Now what did an Indian agent do? Well they were building their relationship up with the natives to show them that the uh, United States Army was not going to abandon them. We would later see that this was not the case especially when we get to the time of the Jackson era but at this point in time they were really trying hard to build up the relationship better. Uh, one of the first uh, uh, Indian agents here was Silas Dinsmore. He actually lived amongst the natives, adopted a, a young Cherokee uh, uh, daughter as well um, that, that had been um, uh, orphaned, and he learned her language. He learned how to be like them, and they really uh, came to admire and respect him. But unfortunately, two years later, he was actually promoted to the USS George Washington going over to the Middle East to fight the Barbary Pirates. So he didn't see that as much as a, of a, of a promotion, but uh, the uh, rest of the government did. So that leads us to the next phase of the blockhouse. You have the factory built here, but you also have another building built over here. And this is actually the hotel. So a hotel was built on this site where natives could stay, uh, whites could stay, it didn't matter who it was, but a hotel was built here. Um, that had food and, and rooms for Lent and everything like that. So this is another unique thing about this fort. They actually had a hotel here. So we start to see the civilian area over here, and we start to have the military area back behind us that we just looked at. So uh, now from 1796 onward, we actually do see a, a nice piece kind of come to this valley here. Uh, there's good trade going along with the Cherokee. The Cherokee are actually learning uh, new crops such as tobacco and cotton. They're trying to bring cotton to the area. Of course, we know cotton doesn't really grow well here, but they did try. Uh, the spinning wheel, the loom, all these great farm equipment that is coming out of the cotton gin. You know, the rich would, be, uh, uh, would be kind of tested here, so to speak. So, so just to see if the Cherokee would actually take on to it or not. So you have this, this civilian area built here. You have another tower built over here, a very large tower. This actually was uh, where they eventually started storing the gunpowder. And then another tower built on the corner over here. Now, in about 1800, uh, there was another push to actually make sure that the, the white settlers were not uh, breaking the treaties once more. And so they actually did reinforce this blockhouse here and they built another barracks on this side. Now, I also think that uh, they had another purpose for building that barracks and bringing in more troops is because they started feeling pressure from the Spanish. The Spanish had actually moved up the Mississippi River and had actually established a fort in what is present day Memphis, Tennessee, on 2nd Avenue, there, uh, underneath the street, uh, the street there, there's actually still remnants of that old fort. Uh, it was called the Castillo de las Barrancas, which meant the, the Castle of Bluffs or Fort of Bluffs. Uh, and it, uh, it was another violation of the Treaty of Paris. And it was also, in a way, the United States saw that as a declaration of war. 
So John Adams at that time, he decided to reinforce these lower forts that were dotting along Tennessee and the rest of the south, uh, southwestern territory here in Alabama, would later be Alabama, Mississippi. And he threatens the Spanish. So he threatens them uh, to get off their property pretty much. And what do you think the Spanish did? Well, they actually backed off. The Spanish governor in, in Louisiana kind of says, okay, guys, we were just getting around. And so they take their men across the river and they set up right there where it would be present day Arkansas. Uh, but from then on out, the Spanish left their galleon right outside of Memphis, present day of Memphis. And all they did was patrol that riverbank and kept watching those U.S. troops that were moving into the area. Uh, and, and they, of course, they, on the old ruins of the Castillo, they actually built Fort Adams. So in honor of President Adams at that point. Now we see another change in the, in the uh, in U.S. government in 1801, and that is when President Thomas Jefferson takes command. And President Jefferson, uh, unfortunately, he was a good man on many of his, his uh, politics and many of his uh, uh, and his doings, but he did not have a very good Native American policy. Uh, and he really was a man of the people. So he told and he kind of discouraged. U.S. Army from still going out into Native American territory and removing white settlers because it, it was a bad image and, and it gets, again, being a man of the people, he did not want to see that affecting his, uh, his, his, his political uh, stronghold, so to speak. So from 1800 on, we start to see the decline of this blockhouse. Uh, we start to see the decline of trade. The Cherokee eventually start moving further south. So what we now have is Delano, Tennessee today. Uh, there was actually another blockhouse built there called Fort Marr. And you can actually still see one of the original towers of Fort Marr at Hawassi Okoe State Park. So I had to put in a plug for them because that is a cool site to go see as well. So if you're ever in the uh, uh, Delano area, I suggest going by and seeing that as well. But that's where the U.S. Army that was stationed here would be moved to Fort Marr in 1807. So what happens after 1807 here? Well, 1807, there's actually a sergeant and his family left here, and his whole job was to actually uh, be a directional sign, pretty much. So like, if there were still Cherokee coming out of the mountains, or if there's still people coming in, you know, wanting to see the trade or do things like that, he'd just be like, okay, you just take that, go past that tree there, go down that road there, and so on and so forth down the Delano. So uh, that was kind of his job. His letters run out in about 1811, uh, but uh, we found more research even today that 1816, there, this place was actually being used as a lumber storage facility for the U.S. Army. So that's a very brief look at the Teleco Blockhouse and its impact on our history here. And for the state of Tennessee, this really did bring peace to the East Tennessee area. Uh, it, it did create a peace with amongst the Cherokee. Uh, and, and did it create a peace with all the Cherokee? No, no, absolutely not. Uh, there were still many Cherokee that were bitter and did not like the United States being here. A lot of them actually moved further south and became Creek. So, because the Creeks were still warring with the United States. And, uh, and so those that were still that were peaceful with the United States actually stayed up here uh, to still trade and barter and, and try to live peacefully amongst them. So, but as we see with history, uh, the, the uh, uh, American story continues to push westward and continues its pursuit of more land and more power. So, that being said, I would like to open up the floor to some questions if we can. Okay, we do have a few questions that have been submitted via the chat box feature, and I guess we'll address those first. The first one is, how did those stationed at the blockhouse preserve the peace between the Cherokees and the encroaching settlers? Did they have to take military action against either side, or was it merely a precautionary role? And that's coming from Bo Carey. Very great question. Now, I, should, I, I can delve a little bit further into that than I did in my segment. Uh, yes, uh, the U.S. Army that came here, and their goal uh, was to actually go out and look for these white settlers and remove them. But they also had the goal of protecting those peaceful from the United States. And say white, then say native, and say what color skin they have. It says those peaceful to the United States need to be protected in this area. So there was actually escort missions provided 
by the U.S. Army from Telco Blockhouse to Fort Southwest Point in Kingston and then over to the uh, Davis, Davidson County area, so the Cumberland settlements that were strongly and were, were steadily growing up through the 1790s. Uh, so because they were already settlements already over there. But one thing, now, I will say this much, when if you're on I-40 going west from Knoxville and you pass that sign that says Crab Orchard, right in that area was a very hot spot for, between U.S. Army soldiers fighting against white, white militia in the area. Uh, there was a lot of caves in those hills there, and so they would actually raid um, uh, either natives going to and from forts or whites going to and from forts, or kind of like highwaymen almost. And so the U.S. Army actually several times from Fort Southwest Point brought their artillery out there and just fired it into the, into the hills there to try to blow up those caves. So that was a really bad hot spot for the fighting between, well, when these U.S. Army soldiers were providing escort. And there were several times where the U.S. Army actually had to turn around. The, the fighting got too intense, and so they had to take their civilians that they were escorting and they had to take them back to the fort and say, we'll try again another time. So, because there's a lot of people that are, again, do not like the United States throwing their weight around here, just like today. We still see it today. Uh, where some people don't like the federal government stepping into some of that. This was the same case either. So, you have people that are going to be bitter, going to be fighting about that. And John Sevier is one of them. Now, John Sevier did not like the U.S. Army in here. He was very vocal about that until he becomes governor, of course. When he becomes governor, he loves the U.S. Army. Okay, we have a few questions, so I'll just address the one that um, encompasses most of the topics concerning records. Um, do any records of the name of those who served here or those just mentioned who would have been served notices they were breaking the Treaty of Tillico or actually jailed for the same? Do any ledgers for the hotel or other commercial entities from the blockhouse still exist? They absolutely do. Um, and, and really, a Blunt's journal, uh, he has several cases where he does write about uh, people that were jailed in Knoxville and here, uh, and that their, their protests uh, to uh, them being jailed in there. And, and, and there's also in um, David Henley's Waste Book, which you can actually see in the archives up there at the East Tennessee History Center and the archives they have up top. They actually have a copy of the waste book, and he does talk about the trade off here and the letters going back to and from people. One of the other biggest sources I've seen has been from the War Department papers online. Uh, there's a lot of work that you can see between William Blunt, between Henry Knox, uh, between Wayne, uh, between George Washington, letters going back and forth about talking about this site and what's going on here. Uh, so that's really and. You can get lost for days on the water papers. It's all scattered to the four winds, so to speak. And and for my research, I have barely hit the corner end of it. You know, it's it's still tons more research to do here. Uh, but I keep finding more and more records of that. And even with the names of the soldiers here, it's hard to say who was actually here with the soldiers, with the rosters. The best way I know the to look into that is to actually look at Anthony Wayne's paperwork, especially at the Battle of Farm. Uh, who was actually on the rosters there for that battle and who was a part of the 3rd Sub-Legion. Uh, later on, um, Captain Edward Butler uh, and his brother, who was a lieutenant colonel here in Tennessee, Thomas Butler, they were both veterans of the Fallen Timbers campaign. And a lot of the men they brought down to reinforce the site were all veterans of that well or being a part of the Kentucky militia that they talk about. Uh, so there's several resources there. But uh, one of the struggles has been doing research on the site because what happens in 1812? We have a nasty war that burns a lot of the paperwork that's housed up in Washington, D.C. Also the Civil War, all these different fires that happened in all these courthouses over the years. You know, it has really put a hindrance on doing the research here and figuring out what all is going on here. And that's why for years people have kind of been like hesitant to do research here, I think just because of, of how scattered this information is. I hope that answered your question. Okay, we have a question from Facebook from Mike Steely. Speak to the white traders and other white men who married into the Cherokee and stayed among them. John Sevier's son married a Cherokee woman, didn't he? 
Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that was, that was really – I mean, the Cherokee really encouraged – the the bonding of, of white settlers to their families just because you know it, it's it's just like any uh it, it, well any society will tell you you want that mixture coming in you want that a healthy mixture coming into your society so it doesn't become stagnant doesn't become stale so yeah it was highly encouraged to do those things however there's a fine line and there's a there's a difference in treatment of those people um if you if we have that child of, of a white man in a Cherokee and they have any type of tint to their skin, they're going to be treated differently in a lot of different places. They're not going to be seen as full-fledged white men. They're not going to be seen as full-fledged Cherokee. They're also going to see as a, as a mixture. So that was another struggle with that, especially in white society, United States society, was actually um, uh, appreciating them and actually letting them be free people and have a say. But no, it was absolutely... Uh, encouraged um to have uh uh white uh, to go out and um and and have a wife or or have children absolutely that was was um not brown okay this is a question from hannah as sequoia would have been in the area at the same time could you tell us about his life as it relates to the block house Absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad uh, Miss Hannah brought that up for as a question uh, here. Uh, happy anniversary, by the way. Uh, so over here at Tuskegee, that was where Sequoia was born and raised. So right out there where that lake is, is right where Tuskegee sat. That was where Sequoia was born and raised at. Now he still would have been just a young man by the time of the blockhouse, and young, really a child by the time the blockhouse was being formed up. So his story was just been beginning um, in comparison to the two. Uh, but Sequoia, you know, eventually would go on to serve the U.S. military, and he would go on to serve and, and, and try to barter a piece to uh, the middle part of the uh, – up until he really – his daughter would continue on his legacy. Uh, but, yeah, that's why we do have the Sequoia Birthplace Museum. So look right here because right out there is where he was born and raised at. So it's a sad story talking about why it's underwater. Uh, and we'll probably talk about that in a whole other segment about the DPA and all that. Uh, but I just want you to try to picture that all up and down this river here, well, you would have seen smoke rising. You would have, if you've traveled down up river here, you would have came by Cherokee towns. You would have had to come by warriors uh, portaging their, their canoes. Uh, you would have seen a lot of activity up through this water system here and so this was something this was really a boundary at the time period uh between uh the the white settlers and uh, they were still coming in and Cherokee on the south side of this river here so absolutely Sequoia uh was just just hop skip and jump over this river and that's where he was born and raised okay can you tell us about the preservation of the blockhouse site? When did that effort begin? That's a very good question. Uh, preservation of the site. So we really got to start looking back to the 1930s. Uh, the 1930s, uh, we actually see the Fountain Association form. Uh, and the Fort Loud Association, a lot of them were, uh, were veteran uh, World War I vets that, that uh, were living in a local area. And they wanted to preserve the site. They knew the site was here. But how did they know the site was here? Well, a lot of the farmers here, to be honest with you, really understood the historical significance of these two sites here. And a lot of these sites were, just were left undisturbed. Um, they knew the blockhouse or some type of fort was here, and they knew Fort Loudon was over there on top of that, on the side of that hill. So a lot of the farmers here really just saved that, didn't kill it, didn't, move, didn't mess with the, any of these places here. So they knew these sites were here, but then we started to see an effort by the Association by the University of Tennessee uh, as well coming in and doing archaeology to figure out what these two sites were and, and how they come into our history. Fort Loudon and takes the is is looked at upon as more important especially for Tennessee history uh, which I'll argue about but at the time period it was it was yeah the romance the figure the 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 craziness of the French and Indian War you know, that there were British troops here. You know, you wouldn't think that for East Tennessee. Uh, you would think that was just, you know, yeah, Cherokees and then boom, you had Americans coming in. Uh, 
Uh, you wouldn't think there would be British soldiers here, but there were. You know, and it has a very significant part of our history is right over there. But for us Tennesseans, I see this site as a more significant part of it. And unfortunately, though, throughout the years, even though UT did do a report over here and they did mass amounts of archaeology, uh, and, but the research just wasn't there and the thought process just wasn't there for this site. But so in the 1990s, we started to see the preservation efforts started of the blockhouse. Uh, we started to see the stabilization of these rocks here. Uh, if you look closer, you know, if you come to this site and you start looking at the rock formation, you can tell that there's actually mortar and there's concrete being poured in between them. You can if you want to, yeah. Uh, you can look behind there. You can actually see cinder blocks underneath this wall actually preserve it. So this is actually to make sure that this wall here, uh, or this here, does not fall in. You can tell with the gravel here as well, the preservation here. Uh, we actually even have bricks and we have drainage here at the site as well. Um, that was actually one of the biggest issues TDEC, uh, the Tennessee Department of Environment Conservation, ran into early on with the site was that this corner over here kept trying to fall into the river. Uh, get the, the river and uh, that uh, the, when the Telco Dam was built, it raised the river up and it started eating, eating, eating it more and more away at this land here. So that corner of the of the blockhouse over there, uh, about where that boat's coming by right now actually was starting to fall in. So they actually did have to rebuild that all up. But all the stonework here is left pretty well on, you know, pretty much untouched for the most part. So that's what's so unique about this site, that you can actually still walk around these, this stonework here. And there are some that argue, and I don't doubt it, that some of the stonework probably did come from Fort Loudon. You know, because afterwards the stones of Fort Loudon were kind of dispersed. Uh, there were several Cherokee houses actually built inside the forts, the old fortification out of the stonework. And, and the soldiers here did have to get the stonework from somewhere. Uh, there was also a quarry uh, out uh, at another story of our park, the Dee Carson Plantation area. There was actually a quarry over there, a limestone quarry that they actually used as well. So there was a number of things going into that. But like I said, preservation didn't really start full-fledged until about the 1990s here with TDAC. Uh, it started a little bit earlier with Fort Loudon, uh, just because of the Fort Loudon Association and them taking efforts to uh, to build on and preserve the site. Okay, I think we can address a couple more questions, then we probably need to wrap up. Um, okay. One new question we have is, what can you share about the Virginia Fort location? Ah, okay, so the Virginia Fort location, that, that doesn't really tie into the blockhouse period. That ties in more with, with Fort Loudon's period. Uh, but uh, if we go back in time to about 1754, 1755, uh, the Virginia's governor, Dinwiddie, and uh, the governor of South Carolina, which I believe was Glenn at the time, uh, they, they were trying to partner with each other to build one fort. And they were hoping it would be Fort Loudon. But as we all have seen British governors, uh, they all become very pompous and they all believe that they are right. So they could not come to an agreement to build a fort. So Dinwiddie actually orders his men to build a fort right across from Choda, which was then the capital town of the Cherokee. By the time of the blockhouse, the capital town of the Overhill Cherokee actually had moved down to Greater Teleco, which is down around near Teleco Plains. Today. So that actually had moved sites at that point. Uh, the Virginia fort, though, was manned for uh, several months by maybe about 20 guys from Virginia. Uh, was it a better place for a fortification? Absolutely. On well, a high block over there, uh, it was right near the Cherokee Capital, you know, so they could trade very easily there. But issues back home in Virginia started to arise, and they turned their money, finances, and soldiers back over to the preservation colony. Uh, so that's when South Carolina decides to step in and build Fort Loudon over here. And so that's pretty much the basis of the old Virginian fort that was that was built up forever here. It, it only lasted a few months, and I can show you where to get to it, but it is on private land this day. Okay. And for those who haven't visited us, the blockhouse, could you uh, provide the address? Absolutely. So if you um, – so when you want to try to get to the blockhouse, I do recommend coming to our visitor center first. You can get more information there about the blockhouse. We can kind of show you exactly where it is. And you can even, we have a little sign 
were there on the pathway going to Fort Loudon talking about the blockhouse. Uh, but uh, for to get to the blockhouse here, you need to go to 149 Blockhouse Road, but you need to type in Vaughn North, Tennessee. Do not type in Maryville, it will take you to Maryville, okay? <laughs> and I've had a lot of people here when I do tours, they'll type in Maryville and it'll go to someplace totally different. It's a blockhouse road, but it's a Maryville. Uh, so you want to type in Vaughn North, Tennessee, 37885. Again, that's 149 Blockhouse Road, Vaughn North, Tennessee, 37885. And we do have signage, a little bit of signage out on 411, kind of trying to get back here to it. And it does sit behind the the TAS water treatment plant as well. So um, there is some some signage where you can actually get back up into here. It is a short walk down to the fort here. Uh, it is paved, but for those of you that uh, may need uh, wheelchair access or, or help with that, you want to plan for to do that. It's about a 200 yard walk or so to get down to the fortification here, but it is it is wheelchair. Great. Um, uh, with this site here, there is plans to actually rebuild sections of, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, with the, the care and upkeep of Fort Loudon sometimes though, that uh, that takes the cake in so many ways to, uh, and kind of prevents us from getting over to a lot of work. Uh, but there is plans to actually rebuild sections of this site here and rebuild a program here really too. Uh, for for years there, there was a couple of rangers here that did actually try to here. Um, but uh, it was very lacking. Uh, we were we did actually have a a a event planned for April uh, here. It was going to be our first uh, living history event. Uh, canceled due to the uh, the climate that we are now uh, uh, still trying to get through. So um, so again, there are, there are plans for that in the future. All right. Well, I think that'll conclude the program. We did want to thank Justin and Lauren and Fort Loudon State Historic Park for partnering with us for our first virtual visit via Zoom. Next week, as Lisa mentioned, we'll be partnering with Renee Rogers and the birthplace of country music in Bristol. It'll be held next Thursday at 1 p.m. And if you'd like to attend, you can sign up via Facebook. We have an event page there. Or you can email me directly at e at easttnhistory.org. It'll follow the same format as today, and we hope to see you all then. If you have any further questions, don't hesitate to reach out again via Facebook, or you can email the Society directly, and we can get those addressed for you um, as promptly as possible. But we thank you for joining us for this first program virtually, and we hope you enjoyed it.